A chemical element, often just referred to as an element, is a type of atom that has the same number of protons in its nuclei as all the other elements of that sort, of that particular substance. So all atoms with one proton are hydrogen, atoms with 24 protons are chromium, and so forth. That is already a dramatic oversimplification of what's going on here, but the important thing to know for the purposes of this conversation, is that all matter in the universe, all substance that takes up space in the universe, and anything that is not the theorized dark matter that we are still speculating about as we explore the wider universe, all matter is made up of elements. So all the stuff that is stuff that we consider matter rather than theoretical dark matter, it is all elements of different kinds. Elements are primarily categorized based on their atomic number, which is equivalent to the aforementioned number of protons that they have in their nucleus. So helium has an atomic number of 2, lithium has an atomic number of 3, xenon has an atomic number of 54, and germanium has an atomic number of 32. And all of those numbers are equivalent to the number of protons that they have in their nucleus. As far back as the 18th century, we already knew of some relatively easy to research elements like platinum, tin, mercury, and zinc, as these elements can be seen with the naked eye, they can be mined with simple tools, and as a consequence we have in some cases been working with them since the days of ancient Greece. Some Greek philosophers of the era, including Aristotle, actually came up with rudimentary conceptions of how these building blocks fit together to make up everything. At the time, assuming that earth, water, fire, and air could be mixed together in countless different ways to give us things like wood, soil, stone, and so on. Now this did not turn out to be true, of course, but it was closer to the truth than we could have known at the time. And although there were a lot of interesting experiments and discoveries along the way, particularly in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that things really took off in part due to a realization by a Russian chemist named Dmitry Mendeleev, who spent his early professional years studying the flow of liquids and the properties of light, and his mid to later years organizing the known elements according to rational principles, and using his organizational method, which came to be known as the periodic table, to predict new ones. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll recall the periodic table from science class way back in the day, and recall, too, that it had a collection of colors and numbers that were apparently important in some way, and which you needed to know and in some cases to memorize, so that you could regurgitate that information onto a test at some point. Interestingly, there actually is a lot of rhyme and reason behind the way that chart is set up. A somewhat shocking amount of rhyme and reason, actually. As a designer myself, the sheer quantity of data that they manage to visually communicate using this chart is really remarkable to me. And it's wild how much of this stuff we already knew back in the late 19th century, before 20th and 21st century gadgetry could be brought to bear on the problem. The innovation of the periodic table was that Mandeleev and others who worked with him on it after he made the initial realization of its potential, the innovation was that they were able to arrange the known elements in such a way that they noticed a sort of rhythm in how those elements were presented when they were all put down on paper together with their atomic numbers on display. Further, they realized there were other trends that became visible when those elements were arranged based on their atomic number rhythm, which allowed researchers to see that, okay, this group of elements have similar chemical behaviors, this group is all metallic, and this group are all odorless, colorless, relatively non-reactive gases. The chart, then, is arranged in seven periods, which are the rows, starting with one at the top and seven at the bottom, and 18 groups, which start with one at the left and end with 18 on the right. Within that fundamental structure, you also find a division between metals on the left, non-metals on the right, and a barrier of metalloids between them. 
there are blocks of color that designate differences in atomic orbital, which means basically where electrons are most likely to be found around the nucleus of the element in question. So kind of a selection of electron orbital patterns. But that too is kind of an approximation of what's being measured. So let's think about that as kind of a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional issue. We also find, based on those groups, those columns that I mentioned, clusters of named elements, like the noble gases, the halogens, and the alkaline earth metals. Though each column also has its own somewhat less dramatic sounding name, like the fluorine group, and the boron group, and so on. What's so impressive about this chart is not just how many relationships it shows, but how many it implies. The development of the periodic table was enough to help Mendeleev and other chemists of the day home in on more specific numbers for elements that they hadn't yet properly defined, often because of the technologies available at the time, or rather, those that were not yet available. But it also showed gaps where other elements, ones that we had not seen, or at least hadn't formally documented quite yet, where those should be. It was almost like looking at a chart of musical notes and realizing that a few were missing, and that quite possibly, if you shifted up or down an octave, you might find even more that continued that pattern even further. So based on trends that they could now see in this chart, things like electronegativity, ionization energy, electron affinity, atomic radius, ionic radius, metallic character, and chemical reactivity, they were able to formalize existing knowledge within this study, within this field, while also nudging the world of chemistry further into unknown but now hinted at territory. There have actually been, and continue to be, alternative periodic tables, some of which, like the one produced by German chemist Lothar Meyer, were eventually subsumed into the main one that most of us use today, as he, along with many others, worked with Mendeleev on his more famous table. Some that continue to be used today, separate from that main table, though, are riffs on the standard periodic graphic treatment, like the so-called 32-column wide table, which shares the same overall look and feel of that main standard vanilla periodic table, but which expands horizontally to give more breathing room to the lanthanides and actinides in the middle of the chart providing what some consider to be a more rational and intuitive view of what's going on in the middle of the chart in particular, but doing so in a format that is difficult to replicate in textbooks, which implies some interesting things about the incentives and priorities that are currently in place when it comes to this sort of knowledge dissemination tool. There are also periodic table variants that focus on one of the aforementioned properties of these elements above all others, like the atoma periodic table, also called the tetrahedral periodic table, which is optimized to show elemental quantum numbers. So it shows the structure in four dimensions to ensure that it properly organizes the four quantum numbers in the elemental electron configuration. Some of the more interesting, and initially at least somewhat boggling and beautiful periodic tables are organized as spirals or something akin to a color chart, or something that looks like nothing so much as a board game. The curled ribbon periodic table, for instance, definitely looks like something upon which you should be moving little plastic pieces based on the roll of a die or the draw of a card. But it's actually intended to more intuitively and elegantly, by some standards at least, organize these elements so that the relationships between them and the empty spaces that they allude to can be more easily understood and referenced. What I want to talk about today is what's happening in the world of elemental research and how recent happenings in the world of chemistry reflect something similar that is happening just across the fence in the field of particle physics. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also contribute via PayPal and Venmo and apps of that sort. You can find out more about contributing in that way at letsknowthings.com. And also super helpful is leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts and or sharing the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it. All methods of patronage and contribution, whatever shape they might take, monetary or non-monetary, are very much appreciated.
A huge thanks to everyone who has already contributed in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from the science journal Nature, the science articles it publishes alongside the research papers that it publishes, that is. And it's entitled Extreme Chemistry, Experiments at the Edge of the Periodic Table. This piece was published at the end of January 2019, and it covers what you might describe as a low-level crisis within the world of elemental chemistry. Namely, scientists are having trouble discovering new elements. Or perhaps more accurately, they are having trouble demonstrating that new ones exist, elements that they suspect, based on what they know about the periodic table and what that table tells them about those blank spaces that I spoke about in the intro, and what the properties of the elements that go in those blank spaces should be. They can describe these unknown elements pretty accurately, but cannot seem to create them. Which is honestly understandable as the process of creating these new synthetic elements, elements that do not typically occur in nature, on Earth at least, as far as we know. Creating them is not as simple as mixing some stuff together in a lab. There are a couple of paragraphs early in this article that describe the situation far better than I could. Quote, if you wanted to create the world's next undiscovered element, number 119 in the periodic table, Here's a possible recipe. Take a few milligrams of berkelium, a rare radioactive metal that can be made only in specialized nuclear reactors. Bombard the sample with a beam of titanium ions, accelerated to around one-tenth the speed of light. Keep this up for about a year, and be patient, very patient. For every 10 quintillion titanium ions that slam into the berkelium target, roughly a year's worth, of beam time, the experiment will probably produce only one atom of element 119. On that rare occasion, a titanium and a berkelium nucleus will collide and merge, the speed of their impact overcoming their electrical repulsion to create something never before seen on Earth, maybe even in the universe. But the new atom will fall apart within perhaps one-tenth of a millisecond. As it decays, it will spit out alpha particles and gamma rays which hit silicon detectors placed around the target to verify that element 119, fleetingly, existed. Researchers have tried this experiment. Chemists in Germany spent several months in 2012 on it, but gave up with no sightings. Scientists in Japan have tried other combinations of beam and target, and both they and a team in Russia have sought element 120, too, but with no luck. End quote. Since 1869, back when Mendeleev first published his periodic table, scientists have discovered or created an average of one element every two or three years. But after Oganesson, element number 118, well into super-heavy element territory, we are finding ourselves running up against diminishing returns. The same amount of effort and resources invested gets us far less in terms of outcome. And if we do somehow manage to get element 119 and 120 confirmed and on the table with our current levels of technology, that would be very impressive. But it's also widely considered to be kind of a ceiling in terms of the tools and knowledge that we currently have available. Short of some new way of looking at the elements or understanding of fundamental science and or some new tools that will allow us to manipulate and measure things in different ways, it's unlikely that we will get much further than where we are now. What worked up to this point, in other words, will probably not get us beyond this point. So let's talk a bit about how things have worked up until now. The process that is today, seemingly at least, failing to move the ball any further down the court in terms of creating new super-heavy elements. Picture a particle accelerator. A machine that slams these microscopic particles together and a bunch of sensory equipment around the beams that are being used to do so. In most cases, this is what the search for new elements looks like. You slam various elements together in an effort to get other, different elements to emerge from their collision and or synthesis. 
What complicates matters is that in some cases, the particles you need to slam together are themselves quite rare and require other collisions to generate them. And in some cases, they only last for seconds or fractions of a second, which means that you are trying to not just detect, but in some cases, slam other elements into these incredibly tiny targets that themselves may only exist for a fraction of a second. And the higher up the periodic table you go, generally the shorter the half-life, the duration of existence of these elements. There are also what we might think of as higher level concerns at this point in the elemental knowledge process. For instance, there is talk that, especially post-element 120, we might find that many or most of all new elements fail to fit neatly within the periodic nature of the chart that we have found to hold true for so long. The reason these new superheavies might deviate from that fairly reliable rhythm is that at a certain point, relativity plays a larger role on the structure of your atom, and the atom becomes so massive, so bulky, that it pulls its electrons in more tightly, closer to the nucleus. That differing arrangement can mean that the new element technically follows the expected property rhythm, but demonstrates very different behaviors in terms of density, in terms of reactivity, and it may consequently not play well with other elements on the table overall, but also may deviate significantly from its homologs, the elements above and below it on the table, which is important because these homologs, the elements that share a column with each other, often share a number of traits because they have the same outer electron cloud arrangement, the same outer orbital as the other elements in that column. What some researchers are proposing, and in some cases already doing, because of this realization that we are not getting the same output for the same number of inputs that we were using before in terms of new discoveries, is focusing on refining our understanding of currently known, already produced, super heavies, rather than fixating completely on generating brand new ones. So instead of using a huge quantity of resources in terms of tech and energy, but also in terms of human beings who are capable of doing this kind of work, many research institutions are recalibrating so that instead of trying to create 119 or 120, they are just creating more of 106, of 111, of 114, of 115. These elements, in most cases, have already been discovered, have been brought into existence at some point and proven to be a real thing. But they have generally then been added to the chart and then more or less set aside. Not entirely, but the resources brought to bear to make them real, to make them first, are often then reapplied toward other things, like then trying to create the next one on the list. The argument here is that we should be taking a closer look at the newer elements that we have already created before so that we can see what deviations from the expected rhythm they demonstrate so that we might then have a better understanding of what to expect with any potential later super heavies. And at the same time, this will help us figure out what, if anything, these newer elements might be useful for and how they potentially could shift our general knowledge of science and the universe. Interestingly, it's actually thought by some researchers in this field that we are nearing the point where chemistry bleeds over into physics. We could get high enough on the elemental chart, in other words, that we are no longer dealing with matter and we start to instead deal with energy, with particle physics rather than elements. Now, it's worth noting that there were similar estimates back in the 1990s when we had just rounded the bend on producing element 112. Some researchers said that 112 was the upper limit of what we could expect to create, and here we are a few decades later, and we're still going, with similar predictions about the recently created 118. So take this prediction with the requisite grain of salt. But whether or not that ends up being the case, there is a similar overall big picture discussion happening right now in the world of particle physics as well. A January 2019 piece published by Vox does a good job of outlining this issue. That piece is entitled The $22 Billion Gamble, Why Some Physicists Aren't Excited About Building a Bigger Particle Collider. And the very telling subtitle is, quote, Particle accelerators have taught us so much about physics that the new one might have nothing to find, end quote. This article is about CERN, 
the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and its ambitions to build a new $22 billion particle accelerator that would be completed sometime around the year 2050. This new project would be more than three times the length of the current largest accelerator in the world, the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. The LHC is about 17 miles in circumference and lives in a circular tunnel underneath the border between France and Switzerland. The LHC is also currently the largest machine of any kind in the world, but this new upgraded accelerator would be a staggering 60 miles in circumference. And again, that's compared to 17 miles for the LHC. So that's just over 27 and a third kilometers for the LHC versus about 96 and a half kilometers for this new proposed project, which is pretty cool. I mean, that's great, right? Bigger batter accelerator equals bigger batter science. Well, maybe. The story here is that building bigger batter particle accelerators doesn't make as much sense as it once did. Back in 2008, when the LHC was finished, its construction began in 1998, by the way, but back in 2008, our understanding of particle physics was at the point where slamming more particles together, better and faster and in larger quantities, was a very compelling and useful opportunity. Flash forward to 2012, though, and we saw a very special boson, the Higgs boson, which is a specific type of elementary particle, which I'll get into in a second, that was originally posited in 1964, and we saw it created within the LHC. And this was a big deal, because it kind of put the final touches on our standard model of physics, wrapping a nice bow around that model, and giving us very little beyond that. No really new discoveries since then, and definitely nothing that upends our theories about how all this stuff fits together, or that points in any radical new direction that we might explore. The standard model, with a capital S and capital M, of particle physics is a bit like the periodic table of elements, in that it is a collection of elementary particles that, when combined, describe three of the four known fundamental forces. Electromagnetic, weak, and strong interactions. So gravity, the fourth force in this model, is not addressed by these particular particles. What we do get here, though, are quarks like up, charm, top, down, strange, and bottom quarks. We also see leptons here, including the electron, muon, tau, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. We see the gauge bosons named gluon, photon, z boson, and w boson. And we have the scalar bosons, a group that includes just one entry, the recently confirmed aforementioned Higgs boson. Now, this model has been wildly successful in helping us understand how physics operates, and it's proven to be right enough to help us make all kinds of predictions, allowing us to say, hmm, well, based on the standard model, this new thing that we don't know exists should look like this. And then we go and discover that thing, and boom, it looks just like the standard model predicted that it would. So in that regard, it is a bit like the periodic table of elements. It is a pattern, a structure that allows us to understand more than we can currently prove, and which can therefore help point us in the right direction that we might explore in next. That said, the standard model has also left us without much insight into all kinds of things that do not seem to fit within the confines of the physical reality that it describes. BSM physics, that is beyond standard model physics, includes things like neutrino oscillations, matter-antimatter asymmetry, the fact that there seems to be more of one than the other. It doesn't tell us what dark matter and dark energy might be. It doesn't fully explain gravity or allow us to account for the accelerating expansion of the universe. It's seemingly internally consistent then and has guided us in the right direction numerous times in the past but it's also seemingly incomplete. It's usually right about the things that it addresses, but it doesn't address enough. We've reached a point where the standard model may no longer be as useful as it once was in terms of explaining this new stuff that we're struggling to understand. Particle colliders, according to some researchers in this space, are being seen in a similar way. They have done so much for us. They have been remarkably powerful tools that have allowed us to push the boundaries of our understanding dramatically. But we've also potentially outgrown them, at least in terms of the edgy fringe research that we need to move on to 
now that we've got the Higgs. Or, to quote a Frankfurt Institute-based theoretical physicist named Sabim Hossenfelder, quote, a bigger particle collider is one of the most expensive experiments you can think of, and we do not currently have a reason to think it would discover anything new, end quote. One way to analogize the problem in particle physics is that it's almost like they discovered element 119 and then 120, and they reached a point where they were as certain as can be that there were no other elements to be discovered past that point. And anything else they discovered would not be an element in the sense that they have always understood elements. It would be something different, something new. So in that theoretical elemental case, and in this case quite possibly with particle physics, what they may need is not a bigger accelerator, but something new, some new theory, some new model, some new tool that will allow them to do things differently rather than more or bigger. It's almost like in both spaces, we humans, and this has been very much a global effort, by the way, so we humans as a species have been building taller and taller things to stand on to get higher and higher up. We built step stools, then ladders, then bigger ladders, then tall escalators, then elevators, and we reached increasingly more impressive altitudes with each new innovation. But at a certain point, we hit a ceiling. We reached the very top of the building that we'd been living within. And to get any further, we would have to build, not just something that will help us get higher within that same building because we are already up at the ceiling. We would get diminishing returns in that regard. Instead, we need to build a new building entirely. We need to build some kind of new structure and aim for a completely new ceiling in a different place than the previous one. At the same time, though, even while we're figuring out what that new building with its new ceiling should look like and how we might build it, we can spend some time and energy exploring the space in which we've existed all these years. Extending the metaphor, we can explore the room further, make it more well-known, more cozy and comfortable. We can master that space, rather than just living inside it, but spending the majority of our effort trying to get closer to the ceiling. The practical manifestation of this metaphor is what those aforementioned super-heavy element researchers have been doing. Backpedaling, to spend more time, creating 112s and 106s, instead of fixating completely on the pie-in-the-sky dream of making a 119 or 120. In the world of the standard model, of particle physics too, there is plenty left to learn, left to flesh out and expound upon. We've been pushing boundaries in these spaces for a very long time. And although many people have spent their lives exploring the already discovered so that we might all better understand these spaces, huge chunks of our research resources have been applied to the pursuit of ceilings for the past 100 years or so in particular. And it may be prudent to reallocate some of those funds to reinforce the walls of our structure as well, even as we start making plans to lay new foundations for whatever type of structure we decide to build next. That said, it also wouldn't be ideal to turn our eyes away from whatever comes next, beyond making existing edgy knowledge common and fringy science into practical capabilities. We tend to flourish most as a species when we have both practical common understandings and utility, but also great big aspirational leaps, currently unprovable theories that we may someday be able to test, as was the case with the Higgs boson, and as has been the case with countless other theories, including some that were posited by Einstein that we still don't have the necessary tools to attempt to prove or disprove today. Whatever the specific shape, though, Fundamental science research and the funding and support of that research is vital to our understanding of the universe and our place in it. Our comprehension of things like reality and the laws that govern that reality and our capacity to dream big, explore brazenly, and comprehend bogglingly complex, sprawling concepts by stacking those ideas atop the others that we've figured out how to explain, communicate, and utilize. But it's also what ensures there will always be dragons on the intellectual map, places that we've yet to tread that are still mysterious and tempting, and which help us dream and imagine and maintain a sense of the possible, of potential. Understanding for the sake of understanding, moving the ceiling ever upward, just out of reach, and building new structures, seeking out new ceilings, then. These are fundamental components of what make us human, but also what help us flourish as humans. If 
if you're enjoying Let's Know Things, you might also enjoy the books that I've written. You can find a list of those books at colin.io. That's Colin with one L. And you might also enjoy my newest project. It's kind of an advice column about life. It's called Some Thoughts About Living, and you can find that at somethoughtsaboutliving.com. The book that I'd like to recommend today is actually an audiobook, kind of an audio course, actually. It is one of those great courses that they have on Audible or via the Great Courses website. It's called The Learning Brain, and it's by Professor Thad A. Polk from the University of Michigan. And I picked up this book because it purported to be about learning in the context of the most recent brain science, the most recent neuroscience that we actually have available from the last couple of years. And it proved to be really insightful and interesting. It taught me some things, even having researched this in the past, it taught me several new things, new concepts that we've recently become aware of as a consequence of just our amazing progress in this field. Now, we still know just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of what we need to know to say much at all with any certainty about the brain. But we have learned a great deal about the practical applications of the brain and what works and potentially why these things work. We also know that a lot of the things that we used to suspect or even present as facts about learning, these things are actually not ideal. And this course has a whole lot of information about those sorts of things as well. So if you are interested in learning more about the brain holistically, but particularly how the brain and brain science applies to learning, The Learning Brain from the Great Courses, which you can also get on Audible by Professor Thad A. Polk, is very much worth your time. I really enjoyed it. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsnotethings.com. You can find out more about the tour that I'm currently on at becomingtour.com. And you can find out more about my newest project at somethoughtsaboutliving.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on your social network of choice. I'm just Colin Wright on Facebook, but I am at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week.